Friends, I bring you greetings from Fort Washington Collegiate Church in northern Manhattan. And also from West End, since I'm the president of this corporation, uh, West End and Marble Church, also your, church, your sister churches in this city, uh, please receive a, a warm embrace, un abrazo, of all of us. And I want to say to our middle family that we love you, we are on this journey with you, and we will get through this together. We will get through this together. And I want to give all of us permission to say, whenever you think it's appropriate, I'm not okay. I need time. I am hurting. I am shaken. I'm stretched. I'm stressed. I'm sad. I'm depressed. Just give, let's give ourselves permission to say all those things during this very, very difficult time. So I, I, the, the title of my sermon is Buscando America, uh, Searching for America. And I want to tell you a quick story. When in the 80s, I was in high school. Parece que fue ayer. Seems like it was yesterday, but it wasn't. That was a long time ago. And I lived at that time in a town called Holyoke, Massachusetts. I was 17 years old, and this Latino author, writer, contributor dared at that time, 1985, to write this article in the local newspaper that was called Holyoke Transcript. And she basically said the Latino community, which at that time meant Puerto Ricans in Holyoke, right? Because you know, we were the largest uh, group of Latinx people. The Latino community, you know, are, are finding their own way. They're making their own way. And it wasn't an easy time for Puerto Ricans in Holyoke. A lot of um, what we still see now, right? A lot of police brutality, a lot of discrimination. And so she dared to write that for the Holyoke transcript. So as a response, this uh, citizen of Holyoke wrote back and said, how dare you, Miss Nunez, uh, write that about Latinos, your people are live like pigs, they're dirty, they're lazy, they're unmotivated, they kill chickens in their bathtubs. And I was like, oh my God, we've never killed a chicken in the bathtub. Should we be killing chickens in the bathtub? I mean, like, like we, we, all the things that were said about Puerto Rican families there in that article, we had that what did not pertain to my experience about being Puerto Ricana in the United States. So this was around the time I was trying to, you know, look for colleges and all of that. And I have to say, so many years later, that that, that, that exchange that, was, that I read in the paper, that, I w that was publicly, it happened in the public square, basically, um, it had an impact on me. A 17-year-old black Puerto Rican in a city that, you know, that did not accept us, that thought that we were the worst uh, of, of the population, and they didn't even see us as human because the, the letter calls for us to become civilized. So I was carrying all of that as a young person and, and trying to, to find what, what was I going to do in this country? I had a, um, a guidance counselor that was Puerto Rican. And she said, listen, Ruben Blades is coming to town. It was almost like a Santa was coming to town. <laughs> and I have two tickets, and you've been a great student, and so I'm going to give you these two tickets. So I went to see Ruben Blades, who at the time, you know, this was the 80s, so he was famous then. I mean, not that he's not now. I'm just saying, you know, for us, he was, he was the singer of the moment. And, um, and, and really, his name is Ruben Blades, because he's from Panama. And um, so we went to see Ruben Blades. The auditorium was not bigger than this church. And we sat towards the middle, in the back around where Claudia's sitting uh, with, 
back there with Susan. Run that almost towards the back of the, of the nave. And, um, and we just, you know, we listened. It was a beautiful concert. It, wasn't, it was not a danceable concert. He was a, he's a very social justice-minded singer. And he sang this song called Estoy Buscando America. I'm searching for America. And I'm afraid that I'm not going to find her because she has been silenced by those who do not believe in the truth. Estoy buscando America. And, and I'm saying, I'm looking for America, right? Like I'm, I'm sitting there and I'm saying, yeah, like, I'm looking for America. And so he proceeded not only to sing an amazing song that gave me a lot to think about as a 17-year-old, but also he told us that that year he was graduating from Harvard Law School. And I found that, you know, to be so amazing at, an, at such an opportune time in my life to hear that from the mouth of a person who until the other, you know, I would, that's not true, but for the, like, I thought Ruben Blay was Puerto Rican, right? Because that's how Puerto Ricans roll. You love us, we, you become part of our family, and all of a sudden you're Puerto Rican, and really you're probably not. So, <laughs> so, that, so he wasn't Puerto Rican, he was Panamanian, but nonetheless, right? So, somos la, somos la misma gente, we're the, we're the same people. So we, so I'm, I'm sitting there and I'm saying, contra. If Ruben Blaze went to law school, I could go to college. I could do something for myself and about my own life. I too am looking for America. He has not found America. I have not found America. He went and did something for himself. I can do something for myself. Yeah. And that's the, that's the power of the arts, right? Like that's, the, that's like the power of the arts. And, and so one of the things that, that I want to talk about with you this morning is that sometimes we become the obstacle. We heard a story, we, some of us know, some church people, you know, we, I was born and the next day I was in church, so we, I, I have heard this story thousands of times. But, you know, the lesson, the scripture lesson this morning talks to us about Bartimaeus, right? And Bartimeo el Ciego. Bartimaeus, uh, the blind man, as people call them, as we teach it to the children. Um, and, but what do we know about him? The scripture tells us he was a beggar. It tells us that he was blind. But Professor Max Skinner, who is a professor that teaches at Luther Seminary, he says, we know a little bit more. We know that he persisted despite of all the obstacles and hindrances that were presented uh, before him so that he could get to Jesus. We know that he asked for the right thing. And we know that he understood that Jesus had the power to change his circumstances. This morning, we are inspired by the persistence of this man. We're inspired that the crowd could not silence him and he kept yelling and Jesus noticed and asked that he would be brought to him, to Jesus. But I, again, want to call your attention to the crowd. Here's this man on the side of the road. I'm going to try to paint the picture. Clearly, the crowd is around Jesus, right? Because we're told we have a crowd. So there's Jesus and there's the crowd that has some access to Jesus because they're sort of surrounding him. They're leaving. But over there, in the margins of this scene, is this man that dares to cry out, have mercy on me, de misericordia de mi. He had not been able to approach Jesus perhaps because of his own disability, and he used what he had, his voice, to be able to get the attention and to get what he needed. Here we are, United Nations Sunday. And the United Nations tells us that they are about peace, dignity, and equity for a healthy planet. Very simple mission. They have priorities that Amanda did a great job today 
telling us about their priorities, but they're basically about peace, dignity, equity for, for a healthy planet. So I want us to take a non-scientific evaluation. How are we doing with that? How are we doing with that in our neighborhoods, in this country, and in our relationship with other countries? We have a nation that knows that Haiti had a, a president who was assassinated, has been a victim of ecological disasters, and we receive their refugees on horseback with, with whips. Can I get an amen? Estoy buscando América. We can say that together. Estoy buscando América. We are the largest contributor of CO2 in the world. In the world. And yet we're surprised with thousands and hundreds of, of thousands of migrants coming to our borders because they have had a drought that have not allowed them to have a good harvest and now they're hungry and they're facing starvation. But we don't own that we have contributed to this climate crisis on the, from the top of the charts. And we are saying, don't come, knowing us. From the year 1995 to about the year 2016, and I may be off a couple years there, there was a range of, of um, numbers of refugees that we would accept in this country. And it ranged from 70,000 to about 86,000 in the Obama years. Do you know how many refugees, resettlement of refugees we can accept this year? 15,000. One five. At a time when we have contributed the most to the crisis around the world that have prevented peace, equity, and a healthy planet. Estoy buscando America. I am looking for America. And so here, here I am with the oldest congregation of the Collegiate Church of New York, Middle Church. So I want you to know that when I'm here preaching, obviamente, obviously, right? This is part of my job. I'm a preacher. But I, when I come to middle to preach, I feel like I'm on vacation. <laughs> there's, a, there's a beauty to you, to this church, that I feel like, you know, I'm going to middle to preach. Yes, I am. <laughs> right? <laughs> I must have, I don't feel like that about all, everywhere people ask me. I love everyone. I, I love you. But there, there are other places that you're like, ay Dios mío, porque oh, I shouldn't have said it. Yes. But, but when I'm coming to middle, there's a un gozo, there's a joy about coming here. Seriously, I mean that with, with I don't say this everywhere I go. You can look at all the recordings. But I, but I want to say honestly, Eh, gracias a la vida, in that spirit of giving thanks to life, that I give thanks to God and to this world for you, for, for Middle Church, for, for Washington Church, for the Collegiate Church. And I want to talk about, to you the oldest worshiping congregation of the Collegiate Church, Middle Church. Imagine if we committed together with the rest of our Collegiate family to be the silencers of the silencer. Like, this, we're going to silence the silencer. The people that are like, no, por favor, please, no, don't, let's not hear the person that's coming from the margin on the outskirts of, we're here in the center, but over there I hear a voice. No, 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 olvídate de eso, forget about that, right? We're going to be the silencer of the crowd in the middle that does not want to hear those who are in the outskirts. And imagine that the oldest corporation in America 
which is the collegiate church, uses its power to silence the silencer. Because we got power. And power is not a bad thing. We got power for justice in these churches, here in Fort Washington, in West End, in Marvel Church. We got power for justice. But imagine if we refocused to say our mission is one of peace, one of equity, one for a healthy planet, one that would silence those who, who would not allow us to hear those who are around us. Imagine what, a different, what different conversations would we be having in the 17,574 15, 17, times we meet every week. That, that, <laughs> those are the number of our meetings, right? I mean, so <laughs> imagine. So then we can, we can say in the words of Ruben Blades, Buscando America, we are going to find you, America, in this darkness. Te vamos a encontrar en esta oscuridad. And it is up to us to bring freedom to you. You know how we say stuff in this country? Like, we are the land of the free. Bueno. If you're a Haitian refugee, if you're at the border with your baby, if you're a black and brown person. You know that I lived in Connecticut for many, many years, and so when my brother would come to my neighborhood, which was Newington, Connecticut, I had to, there was a time that I said, nope, I'll meet you in Hartford, because he would not, he would get stopped every time. Every time. Every time. He had one of those low cars, you know, the, the cars that are low. That's not a crime. He will get stopped every time. So a land of the free, mm, we, we got to deconstruct that a little bit, right? Or a lot. Imagine what it would be that we have an immigration policy that does not separate families. I want to just tell you, that this separation of families transcends political parties. We're ministers of the sacrament and word, and so therefore, we got to speak truth. In the Obama administration, three million people were deported. Three million. The method was a little different, right? They said, we're going to deport the bad people. They will come and separate families in their homes in their homes. In the Trump administration, the method changed. They would separate them at the border and then put them in this warehouse that was, had divisions of chain links that began to be called in, in the Latino community, in the Latinx community, Las Perreras, right, where you keep dogs. And there the children, we all saw them were there with blankets of um, that aluminum sort of blankets and on the floor separated. And, and psychologists and psychiatrists are saying that the impact of that, of that separation in those children and families, it is, it is we, they cannot even estimate. It cannot be measured. And history will, will, re, will remember us by these things. But I say to us today that regardless of what's happening in the White House or around our neighborhoods, we have a call, church, to silence the silencers, to find America, to, to, to look for America, buscar America y encontrarla, to, to look for America and to find it so that we can live in that peace in that justice, in that responsibility with our planet. And I make a call today to 
I mean, I, what I'm calling middle to do is already doing, which is you, you're doing amazing things with elections and, and justice. But I, those who are listening to me, who are not, who are listening to, to what's happening here around the world, what I'm saying this morning is something middle is already doing. But what if, wherever we may be, we commit ourselves to find America? to bring freedom to America and not accept that we are already a land of the free and to find America for this generation and for the next and to use our power to create change that is sustainable. Change that is hard. And for that, friends, for that, we, not, you have, we have to unite our voices we have to make a commitment. We have to have a determination that we will seek what we will find. And at the end of the day, no one will silence us. We will silence the silencers.